Good afternoon. Welcome to today's SCA webinar about what are you missing about your well and reservoir. Fiber optic sensing could give you the answer with Dr. Dennis Drea. Before we start today's webinar, we'd like to ask a few questions about the demographics of our audience. So I'm going to launch the polling questions. And the first question is, what is your primary discipline? So we're getting a good response. Thank you. We have quite a few petroleum engineers in the audience, uh, quite a few geoscientists. Boats are still coming in, but we also have some petrophysicists. Okay, looks like most of you have voted now, so I'll go ahead and close and share the results. We have 50% geoscience, 40% petroleum engineering, and 10% petrophysics. So the next question is, how many years of full-time experience do you have in the upstream oil and gas industry? Getting the responses, quite a few of you have over 30 years experience. And also a good sized group in the 21 to 30 year range. Looks like most of you have voted, so I'll go ahead and share the results. We have 45% with 21 to 30 years. We have 36% with over 30 years and 18% with one to 10 years experience. So thank you for uh, voting in the polls. Before I introduce Dennis, I'd like to remind the audience that you are muted but you may ask questions during the presentation using the GoToWebinar question feature. We will cover the Q&A at the end of the presentation and you will be anonymous. The webinar today is what are you missing about your well and reservoir? Fiber optic sensing could give you the answer. Our speaker today is Dr. Dennis Drea. Uh, Dennis comes to us with a wealth of experience. He's worked in a number of capacities for operators including Shell, uh, where he was uh, Shell's global subject matter expert for production logging, permanent sensing, and the subject matter expert for mud logging. He has quite a bit of experience in petrophysics in all areas. So the class that Dr. Drea teaches for SCA is in-well fiber optic sensing. That will be offered in person in SCA's Houston Training Center, November 6th and 7th. And we also have a class that's upcoming <clears throat> very soon. Uh, Dr. John Lee will be teaching PRMS and SEC reserves and resource regulation. That's offered live online, half days in the mornings, uh, July 31st through August 3rd. <clears throat> and of course, SCA courses can be taught in-house, so be sure to contact us if you would like to have a course taught in your location. Uh, and refer to SEA if you have any other needs for consulting, for direct hire services, for projects and studies, as well as training. So I'm going to pass the presentation rights over to you, Dennis. Okay. And you should have the presentation rights. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for the introduction. And let me just get my screen back on. Looks good. Okay, there we go. Oops, let me. I am locked up here. There we go. So what are you missing with your well and reservoir? Uh, and I do want to stress that although we'll be talking primarily about measurements in the well, that we will be getting information about the reservoir, particularly near well bore, but also a little bit out into the reservoir. So let's let's move right into everything. What are you missing about your well and reservoir? Uh, I'd like to start out with an example that 
that involves a look back that was done and reported out a few years ago. And this comes from the unconventional uh, resources world. And there were a variety of reports that, uh, that came out from major and well as independent operating companies that uh, identified that they were having underperforming wells or sections of their wells were thought to be underperforming. Uh, they primarily uh, identified that via running production logs and things such as that. Uh, they found, for example, in one Eagle Ford well that, that between 10, or excuse me, that 10 out of 14 stages showed interstage communication. So from one reason or another, they were uh, having communications from one stage into another, production showing up into an, uh, from one stage into another, and so on. Uh, their diverter response was fairly inconsistent, and this led a result, or excuse me, uh, results like this uh, led to a multi-basin look back that was performed <clears throat> by some folks at, at Halliburton, uh, where they found uh, very surprisingly that they had communication seen in 40% of their frac stages. So 40% of the, uh, of the frac stages were performing, uh, most likely underperforming because of this, this communication issue, cross-stage uh, cross communication. Uh, they also found that the average pump volume leaked per stage was as much as 45%. Now that is a lot of fluid that you're losing that, that is not being effective in, in stimulating the reservoir. Uh, it's a lot of energy that's being used to do the pumping that is not being used to stimulate the reservoir. That, that, may, that all corresponds into a lot of cost. So in addition to having underperforming uh, assets, underperforming wells, uh, the, the costs were much larger than, than they should be. Um, they found, for instance, that increasing to more, at that time, increasing to more than three or four perf clusters led to non-uniform fluid distribution. And with that, uh, I want to use that as just as a lead in. Um, if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always got, and attributed to Henry Ford. So it's, it, it, reinforces the, um, uh, the notion that if you get information, if you suspect you have a problem, sometimes even if you don't know that you have a problem, in getting more additional information, you can reduce your uncertainty, be able to change what you have been doing, uh, sometimes slightly, sometimes drastically, and end up with something that is, is just, it can um, quite a bit improved. Some examples of this, uh, and again, staying in the in the unconventional world, uh, the EUR uplift observed for refracts, uh, and this was uh, through fiber optic sensing. They found that they had uh, primarily fiber optic sensing. Uh, they got information from wells they had instrumented with with fiber optics, and then they applied these learnings to the new wells. And they found in the Eagleford one case where they had 121% EUR increase and they significantly lowered their decline rate. Um, the average EUR increase in two wells were producing uh, about 1,000 barrels a day at that time. In the Haynesville, they saw more than a 200% improvement in, in refract wells. Uh, this led to a 2 BCF incremental production increase. The, um, the result of the, um, this full look back was that uh, in, in the, uh, the resulting uh, um, crunching of, of the numbers based on what they thought the, the, if, when they thought the problems could be, uh, could be resolved had they had more information from the wells, is that the estimated ultimate recovery uh, increase that they could see were estimated to be quite large. And, the total estimated potential for the redesign involved redesigning the fracs using the monitoring data, re, re, excuse me, redesigning the refracs in particular. You can see the, um, um, the uplift that they had, had anticipated. Uh, additionally, we've had results reported from major and independent operating companies uh, showing that they have significant value in understanding and op optimizing individual well performance 
but the greatest value is extracted from learnings that they use in the new wells and new fields, being able to use information they get from this monitoring and uh, the, the tweaking of their processes based on that to, uh, uh, to calibrate their models or recalibrate their models, uh, to optimize hydraulic fracture stimulation and by doing things like increasing the frac efficiency, reducing the costs, and stimulate more stages. And really important is the having an increased understanding of the reservoir, being able to use that information for better well placement or changing the total well count and things like that can lead to a, a much improved EUR. Uh, the references I show here uh, from, a, uh, from several different companies, uh, both large and small, uh, from, from a, examples, for example, from Shell and, and Devon. Um, the uh, reporting from uh, taking some information that was from, the, from ConocoPhillips, uh, they have uh, had a, a uh, significant number of instrumented wells that they've put together uh, were the primary monitoring installations that they've used or intervention in, uh, sensing that they've used involved distributed temperature sensing and, and distributed acoustic sensing as well as pressure and temperature gauges. And combining this with, with microseismic, uh, they found that they got a better understanding of the physics of the reservoirs they were draining. Uh, this allowed them to calibrate the models with the data and the learnings that they had obtained from these uh, these instruments that they put into the well. And they applied the learnings from these wells. And again, this was a very limited number of wells, but it, they were well-designed uh, experiments, if you will. And they used that to design the future wells, affecting such things as the completion design and the well spacing. And their estimate was that they increased their total resources by 39%. Uh, so this is based on having you know, the same assets, but seeing an increase in the, in the resource via about a 700 million barrel increase from 1.8 billion to 2.5 billion barrels. So those are significant numbers. It tends to, uh, to be very convincing to, um, uh, to to really get the understanding that you need and to get the right information to, um, uh, to apply it for impro improving your, your bottom line. Uh, another example came from BP and Lewis Energy in the Eagleford uh, using their instrumented fiber optic instrumented wells, which they, um, uh, they call their geoengineered wells, using uh, distributed temperature sensing, distributed acoustic sensing. Um, in some cases, the, uh, they had used, I believe, a, a wireline cable that had a fiber in it to, uh, to make, some of their, uh, make, make some of their fiber optic measurements. So they were able to, uh, to do it at a, a reasonable cost. They added complementary uh, surveillance technologies. And let me go grab my pointer here, sorry. They used a direct measurement of, of completion efficiency with distributed fiber optic sensing. Uh, they ended up uh, advancing, using having advanced 3D fracture and reservoir model calibrations based on those, those measurements. And were evaluating multiple model outcomes uh, based on variables such as cluster efficiency, uh, stimulated rock volume, and enhancing production and well performance. Now using uh, these models, so that so basically they varied their, uh, you know, they, they would do something like varying the cluster efficiency, varying the, uh, the stimulated rock volume, and and uh, so on, in each of these uh, realizations of the model uh, when they run ran each model, and found that the uh, when they applied the optimal conditions to their new wells, that the field results showed a 15% uplift for an average field type curves using optimized completion design that they had come up with in their diagnostic models. That is shown here the, um, where the, the blue line is their, their typical uh, field type curve 
and the red dotted line is the uh, this is the initial red uh, production and so on. You can see the uplift they have. So a very significant uh, significant improvement was seen. Uh, intelligent well control for reservoir management and optimization. Uh, this is an offshore example, offshore Norway, you, again using fiber optic sensing. In this particular case, it was for a uh, an offshore platform well where they had 24 well slots of which, and in those they was at that time that this was uh, this data was gathered. There were 16 producers. Uh, one gas and three water injectors, and then four water alternating gas. So these were CO2 uh, WAG injector wells. The uh, rather than, in addition to having the distributed temperature and pressure, they used optical downhole optical pressure, temperature, and flow meters uh, to analyze the the uh, the injection the WAG injection into each of three zones. And with this, uh, they found that they had improved, were able to uh, effect improved reservoir management. Uh, the equipment uh, that they used supplied real-time PET and pressure and temperature as well as zonal rates and accounted for uh, cross-flow and totalized volumes. Um, they were able to, uh, to uh, effect the correct zone selective injection and to be able to confirm that they did have downhole zonal isolation when they wanted to be zone, in, uh, zone selective in their injection. Now the value that they saw was, was ongoing. Uh, they saved, they found that they saved by incre increasing their efficiency, their overall efficiency of their injection, uh, that they saved one to two well slots, which allowed for additional producers to be put in. Uh, they eliminated at least one injector uh, and this at the time, again, this was in, in 2015, uh, that reduced a, reduced the cost, an upfront cost of $10 million, and also eliminated a significant number of wireline logging jobs. So with all of those, they found that they, um, uh, the results they had, that, that they totally replaced their wireline logging with the, uh, uh, the combined distributed uh, measurements as well as the, um, the fiber optic pressure gauges and the fiber optic flow meters. So again, significant, significant value. For the... Now, how, how is all this done? I'll just real briefly go through a little bit of the, um, uh, of the systems that we, uh, we will be using. You'll, when you talk about fiber optic, particularly in the going into a well, that you will hear things like a multi-mode fiber or single-mode fiber. And basically, a single-mode uh, fiber it has a very thin core. And the core, as we see right here, is this small area that transmits the light. The light stays within the core uh, by total internal reflection. The cladding is shown in the gray uh, surrounding the core on this photo. And the core is of such small diameter, there effectively is a single mode, or if you will, a single path for the light to pass through the, uh, uh, through the core. So if you have a multi-mode, it's a much larger diameter core, and there are multiple paths for the light to, to follow, meaning multiple, uh, multiple modes of, of transmission of the light. And there are, are two different types of multi-mode fibers, uh, the graded index, which is the one that is typically used in, in our uh, downhole applications, as well as this what's called the step index. Now, the, uh, again, the, the graded index multi-mode fiber and the single-mode fiber are the ones that are primarily used. DTS, distributed temperature sensing, largely uses uh, the, uh, the multi-mode fiber. Uh, the distributed acoustic sensing and distributed strain sensing usually use multi, or excuse me, usually use single mode fibers. Uh, it just ends up with a higher quality of, 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 um, of data that you get out of it. The, um, although there you can run D DTS on a single mode and you can run DAS on a multi-mode, 
is just uh, might affect the overall quality just slightly, but still can get very good results. And I'll show some some very good results from multi-mode, uh, actually some VSPs from that were acquired by multi-mode later on in, in this talk. So uh, with this, the fiber, the light uh, is used to get information from some type of a transducing element or a sensing element. And we have basically three configurations that we'll look at. Uh, the most common one that you will hear about is this distributed sensor. And that is one in which the fiber itself is a continuous sensing element. So light shines down the fiber and there are multiple reflection points or scattering points that we call them scattering centers. And these are inherent or intrinsic um, uh, heterogeneities in the the glass structure, so you get a scattering, and a portion of the light is trans is reflect basically reflected back or, or scattered back up the fiber back towards your your instrument, towards the surface. Now, at each point where there is a um, uh, a scattering, there either is, there is either some physical, there usually is some physical information that gets imparted to the light. It, it either can change the frequency of the light slightly, or it will cause, you know, you'll see a, a change in interaction between scattering centers that are very close together. And using those in a variety of fashions, you can get, uh, get information such as uh, an acoustic, uh, an acoustic uh, um, sensing, if you will. Uh, on, there are single point sensors, and these are, include the, uh, the example that I'd shown for the, the CO2 injection monitoring that was done in Norway, offshore Norway, in which you add a sensing element. Again, this is an optical element of some type, but it is you know, a packaged element. Light travels down the fiber. The fiber itself is really just the transmission line in this particular case. Uh, when the light packet gets down to the sensing element, it interacts with something in the elements, uh, the structure of the element, something that it, in the structure that uh, makes it a transducer. And the light is returns to the surface. And it, with it, it carries that information that it obtained in the, this uh, optical sensing element or transducer. So this is the basis for the pressure temperature gauges that I had shown in that that offshore Norway example, as well as for the flow meter, the multi-phase flow meter that they used, which was uh, totally uh, based on, on optics. There is another category, which is uh, kind of in between where you have a large number of single sensing elements. And by large, I'm much more than just multiplexing, uh, you know, 10 or 40 or 100, we're talking about adding effectively several thousands of these sensing elements, uh, in, typically in the form of, of fiber brag gratings. And this allows for specific information but that is very, uh, uh, with a very high sensitivity and a very uh, high signal to noise ratio to, uh, to be returned with, with some very significant information. So single point sensors, these quasi distributed sensors and the ubiquitous uh, distributed sensors. For each type of these, right now commercially available, we have, for example, the um, for a single point sensor, we're able to measure pressure, temperature, multi-phase flow, strain, acoustics, and as a subset of the acoustics, seismic. Uh, in the multi-point or quasi-distributed, We uh, we see that we see commercial applications for measuring temperature. Pressure is not quite available yet. It's sort of available, but it's not uh, it's not widely used because of the the accuracy and and so on. But we make temperature measurements, strain, and also having enough of these elements, these quasi distributed sensing elements, that we can actually reproduce an image of the strain. For instance, if we take this fiber and deploy it on a mechanical body, we can visualize using that strain information, we can visualize the change in shape of the body. For distributed sensors, we see uh, that 
very typically we will measure, and th these were the first uh, fiber optic measurements, first distributed fiber optic measurements that came out in oh, about the mid 90s, uh, which was using Raman techniques to, uh, to measure temperature along the fiber. So using a Raman or a Brewan technique measuring temperature, we're using what's called a really backscatter technique. You can make temperature measurement. Uh, pressure has been attempted and it is uh, something that people are still working on in order to be able to get uh, sufficient accuracy, um, as well as the, the deployment uh, challenges. And chemical is is something that has uh, surfaced and is resurfacing again as as a significant need. It's partially available. Uh, the applications for chemicals are in th chemical sensing, distributed chemical sensing, and fiber using fibers is uh, there's quite a need for it in the carbon capture and storage uh, realm. Uh, acoustics uh, using a Rayleigh backscatter, so that is a typical DAS or DAS, distributed acoustic sensing, that uh, started to become available in around 2000, uh, 2010, 2011, very in a very uh, wide range, and actually overtook uh, distributed temperature sensing as the primary attention getter in the, uh, the fiber optic sensing world. Uh, also, interestingly, to measure strain. So we see that there, as listed here, there are a variety of different uh, techniques that can use fibers to measure strain. And by strain, uh, these you know, strain measurements are things such as uh, having tubulars, being able to watch tubulars deform. Uh, you're able to look for fractures opening and closing, things like that. Uh, that there are three primary technologies that are used currently, particularly in diagnosing um, and, under, and getting better understanding for hydraulic fracture stimulation. Those are uh, the Brewan techniques, the Rayleigh backscatter techniques, and there are two of those. One is the DAS and the low frequency DAS, and something called distributed DSS, distributed sense, excuse me, strain sensing using Rayleigh frequency shift. And I will talk about that in just a couple of slides. So how are these, uh, how are these fibers used in the well? Uh, here is a typical configuration. Uh, we have our cartoon of a well. This has, shows casing. It's a cased well, has production tubing or injection tubing in it. In the center here, we've got some packers. Uh, the fiber optic cable is actually shown here, deployed, and it will be attached or clamped onto the uh, the production tubing. Uh, these things called DMCs are dry weight, dry, excuse me, dry mate connectors, and they are able to connect through pass-throughs on things like the packers, and also the wellhead outlet. And what these allow is pressure isolation uh, from uh, from the top through to the bottom of the of the uh, the pressure control device, in this case the packer. Uh, we show that on this example we have at the termination of the of the fiber cable we have a temperature pressure sensor again an optical gauge. It is mounted in a side pocket mandrel that is very similar to uh, almost identical to the, uh, the side pocket mandrels that that uh, are designed for, for pressure gauges that are currently used downhole. Comes out of the well, goes through the wellhead outlet, which is a, uh, it's a pressure control device, basically. Goes through a surface cable and into the surface instrument. So this is one in which the, the <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, uh, the fiber is attached to the production tubing. We have one, uh, there's another variation. This is used quite often in, when you, in unconventional wells, the long laterals even, uh, where the, um, the optical cable is clamped to the outside of the casing and as the casing is run in and then it is cemented in place. So you get information uh, that is obtained right on the outer, basically the outer wall of the, of the casing, but it's also in, intimate contact with the formation uh, with a, with a um, 
uh, a little bit of a connection through the, um, uh, the cement sheath. So this is a permanent fiber optic cable installation, typical one that we would see. Uh, there also are ways to, uh, to basically do a fiber optic logging uh, through some type of an intervention where the, uh, uh, the cable would be lowered or pushed or somehow carried through uh, an, an opening either the, through the um, production tubing or through one of the annuli. Uh, this can be done using coil tubing, a fiber optic instrumented coil tubing. In some cases, it's a, you use a combination of, of a hybrid uh, fiber optic electrical conductor uh, cable that is inside the coil tubing. Also have fiber optic uh, enabled wire line and slick line. And one of the newer cases, uh, one of the newer um, uh, commercial products, which is out, out here and which is actually been run now many hundreds of times is a disposable fiber deployment by, uh, by a company called WellSense, uh, where the fiber is not in a cable form. It's, it's basically in a, um, it's basically a bare fiber. It gets dropped into the well, it goes down into, into the, um, uh, either gets, relies just on gravity for a vertical or near vertical well, or can be pumped down if you, put some, um, uh, some swab cups basically on the, uh, the little torpedo that carries the fiber. And you can get it out into a long, uh, a long lateral well. So again, coil tubing, wire line, slick line, and the disposable fiber uh, measurements are all examples of interventions. Uh, the ability to do this allows a relatively low cost acquisition of the fiber optic data that we'll, we'll be talking about. Uh, just real briefly, just to show you some, give you a, a handle on how some of these devices work, and I won't go into details of it. Uh, there are several different configurations of uh, optical pressure gauges. And again, these are downhole pressure gauges, which have absolutely no electronics involved in them at all. So the the power to them comes basically from the light and interacts with, in this in one case, it uh, measures a, an interference pattern in an air gap within a structure uh, of the, within the structure of this, this optical pressure transducer. So pressure on the outside causes the extension or compression of the body and that air gap Will end up will end up uh, varying based on a pressure change. In another case, we have things called fiber gratings that are used. Uh, so we've got uh, several companies that use a uh, this interferometer technique, and uh, at least one major service company that uses a, a brad grating to uh, to accurately measure temperature and pressure. Now, with these pressure gauges, uh, these are provide quality measurements that are very, very close. Uh, in in many cases, it can sufficiently replace the uh, the high precision quartz gauges. Um, likewise, in another single point sensor, this multi-phase flow meter. I won't go into the details, but basically, it in a, um, a mandrel that is added to the production tubing. Uh, which has a full bore, so no internal upsets in the diameter of the of the production tubing. It makes a measurement of the of the bulk velocity and the speed of sound and the temperature and pressure. And with all of that, we're able to determine what the water cut is and to determine the oil rate and the water rate. So these are uh, some, with something like a 5% accuracy, which is an extremely good uh, Downhole measurement. Actually, it's extremely good, even surface measurement, if you were to use it for that. So, excellent uh, multi-phase flow meter with some references for the uh, uh, for, to describe the uh, the development and in, in the initial installations and and uh, validations. So, uh, again, 
going back to the single point quasi distributed and distributed uh, measurements. Uh, we talked about the, uh, the pressure measurements uh, and temperature measurements using uh, this uh, external Fabry Pro interferometer type of technique where the glass fiber print brings a pulse of light down and it reflects off of one surface and then continues and reflects off the other surface and the interference pattern that gets obtained from that reflection is recorded. As you apply pressure, the shape of this will change. If you apply pressure, typically it would elongate, which would increase the air gap and it changes from one type of interference pattern to another. And you character, use this change in interference pattern to characterize, actually to, um, um, it's calibrated to give you the, the pressure change and hence the, the absolute pressure that you have. Uh, with, with the Bragg ratings, and I'll talk about Bragg ratings or fiber Bragg ratings or FBGs, you may hear about this. Uh, in the core of the fiber, typically a single mode fiber, you have a series of uh, increases in the uh, re refractive index that's, that's uh, uh, imprinted in the core via the during the manufacturing process, the fiber manufacturing process. And as light comes down here, it reflects off of each one of these surfaces, if you will, each one of these bands of, of varying uh, index of refraction and comes back. So as light transmits through, you get a, what's shown as the screen pulse. So it's a characteristic uh, reflected spectrum. This gets reflected, the single wavelength of light gets reflected back to the surface and collected. If you strain the, uh, the glass, glass fiber in this place. If you, uh, if it's, for example, bonded to a diaphragm or if it's simply strained by some other uh, technique by, by stretching, uh, you'll try, you will increase the separation between these bands of index, varying index, refractive index, and that will end up causing a shift in the returned pulse of light, the reflective spectrum. And you can directly calculate from this strain-induced wavelength or frequency shift of the reflected spectrum uh, what the pressure is. So it's a very well-behaved, uh, gets calibrated on the surface and extremely good um, uh, and robust and accurate, can provide an accurate and robust pressure measurement or temperature measurement. Uh, in the, uh, the the fully distributed light uh, or distributed sensing, motion, the laser and the surface instrument will transmit a pulse of light. It will scatter basically at every point along the fiber, and you'll get information back. the uh, The distance of the particular sensing point is basically going to be described by the two-way travel time of the pulse going down to that and then the reflected or uh, back re uh, the back reflected light coming back. So at each point along the way, you, if you collect this as a function of time, you will be able to deconvolve that into a length of fiber. Now with the, um, if you have no uh, other interactions, and this is the case in, in a large number of, you know, probably 99 point plus percent of the, uh, the light that you get reflected back, is going to be of the same wavelength as the transmitted laser light, this lambda naught. That is referred to as a Rayleigh backscatter. Now, there is a portion of light that undergoes a spectroscopic shift, and there are two different uh, frequency shifts or wavelength shifts that occur. One is called the Raman effect and the other is called the Brewan effect. These are able to provide you with information such as temperature and strain. Uh, with the Raman, we see that we are able to get a very, you can make, have a very high uh, a, a temperature measurement that has very high sensitivity. 
uh, it's very weakly, very weakly responds to strain. So that makes a good temperature measurement. This Brewan effect uh, will be having strong uh, sensitivity both to temperature changes as well as strain changes. In other words, the fiber lengthening or, or, or shortening in this distance of, uh, over which it's uh, interrogated. So you get a temperature and a strain uh, combined temperature and strain effect, and then you can there are ways that you can deconvolve that using various technologies. The uh, the Rayleigh backscatter is the primary peak that is going to be used for for DAS and uh, distributed the Rayleigh frequency shift uh, distributed strain measurements. So DAS and distributed strain. Uh, using Rayleigh frequency shift, we'll be using the Rayleigh peak. Um, talk just real briefly about how DAS works. Uh, if we have the fiber shown here, and we have a pulse of light, and it's a very sharp pulse of light, we see basically what, what the size is of this pulse of light. At one point, it's going to uh, reflect information from this this point, and then after a certain point in time, the pulse will have traveled, and now it is going to be basically interrogating this portion of the, the glass fiber. So this, this DZ that we have, the separation between this distance that the light pulse travels in one sample time to the next, <clears throat> excuse me, is called the gauge length. So when you work with uh, distributed acoustic sensing, one of the instrument settings that uh, everyone will be paying attention to and quoting is what is the gauge length of the measurement that they made. So if the strain response is to a, an acoustic wave impinging on the fiber, uh, the resulting measurement essentially records the acoustic wave. So what, what act, and this response that we're talking about here is is actually the um, uh, when the distance that it travels, uh, you basically will look for a change in this distance that it travels over a particular length of time, and that is reflected in basically in, in this travel time. And you directly can calculate the strain from one sample to the next. <clears throat> if it's uh, uh, if the response is due to an acoustic wave uh, causing a lengthening or shortening of, of the fiber. Uh, you're essentially recording, able to record the acoustic wave by integrating these strain changes. Uh, if your uh, strain is a quasi-static or, or nearly static mechanical deformation, so if you're basically bonded or, or connected to the uh, to a rock wall uh, and you have a, a deformation of that rock, for instance, a fracture opening, this response provides what's essentially the strain rate, and then you integrate that strain rate to provide the fiber strain. So that's, uh, and that fiber strain then can be used to estimate what the strain is of the, the reservoir. Okay, uh, just real briefly through this, we have something called the Rayleigh frequency shift, uh, uh, distributed train, strain sensing. In which case we see that we have a pulse of light coming down. It reflects off of these scattering centers. <coughs> the back reflected light uh, ends up providing with, with a spectrum. We have uh, the, these scattering centers are depicted in this cartoon by these red dots. If you compress the fiber, these red dots get a little bit closer together. Um, in the original fiber, you get a particular spectrum that comes out with the compressed fiber or extended fiber, you're going to see a shift in the spectrum, the reflection spectrum. And you can use this to get the, and we show here the before and after. So <clears throat> the baseline is shown in blue, the shifted spectrum is shown in red, so that's under compression. <clears throat> you run a cross correlation, you find that if we shift this, which ends up being like minus 34 or 36, uh, uh, gigahertz, you get the red and the blue overlay. This frequency shift can be used to calculate the strain, change in strain, and the change in temperature by very well-behaved functions. 
And in order to de deconvolve the strain and the temperature, <clears throat> you can do one of two things. One is there'll be many cases in which you can assume that as strain is occurring, temperature is not changing. So you can simply assume that the uh, all of the strain is due to the mechanical strain or excuse the frequency shift is due to the mechanical strain. Uh, the other is that you can make an independent temperature measurement and you can use that fiber also to make a distributed temperature uh, measurement and use that to, to correct it to be able to calculate what the effective strain is. A, a great application is shown here in, again in the unconventional world. Uh, this is uh, showing two different stages, the stimulation of two different stages. And what we want to show, this is a distance plot. This is a per perforation cluster, excuse me, the per shows the perfor perforation cluster locations for uh, stage A and then likewise for stage B. <clears throat> and the top is the, the uh, distributed acoustic sensing called frequency band extracted band. And we can see that from this that we have areas that uh, have a lot of acoustic activity and areas that have very little acoustic activity. And what the interpretation of this is, is that where we have a lot of acoustic activity that is at this particular cluster, that's green as it will be determined uh, or diagnosed as being a, an effective uh, uh, perforation. This one is an if it's no activity, then the assumption is that it is an unstimulated uh, perforation location, perforation cluster, and so on. Now, this particular well was then put on production, and after it produced for a while, the uh, uh, well was shut in, and the distributed strain measurement was made. And what we what was seen was that at certain locations, and they, these lined up with the perf clusters, we saw a huge strain effect as the um, uh, the pressure built back up in the uh, in the region of the um, uh, in the near well bore region as the uh, the production was shut in, and you started to get a pressure build up. And this happened at each of the green or effectively stimulated. excuse me, stimulated, so stimulated uh, perf clusters. And these ended up lining up very good with what was seen with the stimulation, during the stimulation, and then this basically is describing the effects uh, during the uh, production period. So useful information for diagnosing uh, if your cluster, uh, if your, your perforating and stimulation uh, process is uh, optimized. Uh, we're short on time, I'm going to uh, to real quickly just describe that uh, one of the nice things about having a permanent installation is that you can have one fiber with with many applications. Basically, a life of well type of measurement is available to you, so you can have hand on basically on demand uh, measurements uh, for you know from the uh, from the completion. Uh, timing, uh, the time of the completion in the case that's shown here, hydraulic fracture uh, stimulation uh, monitoring and diagnostics. You're able to acquire passive seismic and also do you, by that uh, is the acquisition of micro seismic monitoring during the fracturing process. When the well starts to flow, you can do flow profiling so you get production information. Likewise, if it's an injection well, I can use get injection information at this point. During the uh, the producing or injection lifetime of a well, you can do time lapse uh, vertical seismic profiling (BSPs) uh, to get information uh, of two types. One is to get interwell sweep uh, information. Uh, the other is to use this for calibration of the uh, uh, of your if you have 3D seismic over an area. You can use it to to calibrate and look for for changes uh, relative to the uh, to a time lapse uh, 3D seismic survey. Um, in some areas, a very high usage comes in the category of wellbore integrity model. Uh, early on in the in the uh, <clears throat> in the completion of the well, 
the cement assessment of, of the cement quality, cementing uh, diagnostics uh, during the whole pro production life of the well. Uh, you can do leaks, leak detections. Uh, you can do reservoir strain monitoring using the fiber optics, and from that you can do things such as size, some um, uh, reservoir compaction or, or extension measurements that will provide information to, um, uh, to better understand what is causing a subsidence event to occur. I'm going to skip through Dennis, a couple of these. <coughs> Dennis, I'm going to interrupt you to let you know you yeah. have 10 minutes left. And so if our listeners want to ask a question, they can put questions in the go to question, go to webinar question feature. Yes. And after uh, today's presentation, they will receive a link to a recording of the webinar. Okay, Thanks. great. Let me just quickly go back, go over to my, uh, my, my final slide. I'll slim through this. Uh, Really, the one that I do want to show here shows that during the hydraulic fracture stimulation optimization, the key is using com the combined optics of which the fiber is, provides several different measurements. Integrating this to uh, uh, provide information that is used to calibrate things such as the geomechanical and reservoir models, and then use these updated models to optimize the field development. So this is really where the, the big value comes in in this particular case. So I will, I'm sorry, I'm just zip through these and come to the summary that what, uh, what we have are multiple uses for in-well fiber optic monitoring and looking at this as a life of, excuse me, as a life of field application. Uh, the, uh, it's often synergistic with other monitoring. So if you if you add, for instance, during the uh, the diagnostic phase, uh, a micro seismic uh, or something like that, you to, to the the fiber information, you can end up with a really good, uh, well balanced picture of what's going on. The economic benefits can be significant. It's important to, uh, to use this information and, and very lucrative to use this information to understand your processes, primarily in improving models or calibrating models that you're gonna to use to uh, basically plan the life of your asset the, in the process that you're gonna use. You can optimize completion and reservoir performance. It's something that's become uh, real, very obvious and very, uh, start to see a lot of, a lot of results being reported, a carbon capture, utilization of storage, and in particular geothermal, and, and again in particular the enhanced geothermal systems, are, are using tech, uh, information that is gathered from wells that is, has typically been gathered in oil and gas applications and is being used to optimize, to understand and to optimize each of these processes. So with that, I will open it up to questions. Uh, later on, you can look at a couple of different references that I have listed here, and also mention the uh, the course that's coming up in November. But let me leave, stay on here and open it up for questions. Great, thank you. I want to remind our audience you're muted, but you can ask questions using the go to webinar question feature. Later today, you will receive <clears throat> a link to a recording of today's webinar, an evaluation form, and a link to register for in-well fiber optic sensing that's scheduled for November 6th and 7th in Houston, Texas. Dennis, can you tell us a little bit about the cost um, and compare and contrast the uh, installed fiber optics versus the intervention uh, situation? Uh, that is... Um... Not, not trying to hand it off or, or bounce, bounce it back. Uh, like any type of data acquisition in the oil field, it's gonna be highly dependent on what type of well, what is the environment and, and the geographic location, meaning how easy it is or expensive it is to get services to a particular location. Um, the, um, but as an example, in a typically, you know, if there is a typical unconventional uh, long lateral, you know, maybe a, a mile lateral, uh, well, it will probably 
you're probably in the range of, of a couple of million dollars to get fiber put in uh, into that well. That includes the instrumentation, the data acquisition, as well as the plan, upfront planning. Uh, something in the range of between a quarter and a half a million dollars, uh, but probably closer to a quarter million dollars for a uh, for the acquisition using a wireline intervention with, with fiber in it to be able to get that all the way down into that long lateral to do a similar type of, of measurement. Okay. Great. Next okay. question. What is your experience in using DAS as VSP? Is it comparable in comparison to conventional VSP? Uh, the, uh, the signal to noise ratio for uh, fiber acquired uh, seismic is is not at the same quality as um, geophones. Uh, that being said, rather than having uh, you have two advantages of two in two ways. One is rather than having a dozen or twenty uh, geophones in the well, you've got a geo basically a geophone every every you know thirty feet along the length, entire length of the fiber. So your, density, your data density is much larger. So you can start to, uh, to get more information and use some techniques that will help you to, get, to, to work with that signal to noise. Um, the, um, so the, qual the quality is not, is, is not quite the same, but it allows you to, uh, to get the information on demand at the time that you want to get it without having to put anything else in the well. You don't have to have geophones. You don't have to interrupt uh, uh, production and so on. Can you talk a little bit more about the use of fiber optics for monitoring a CCS project? Current, currently, the largest usage that is being seen is for uh, monitoring uh, the um, uh, Injection location, where where the basically an injection profiling type, and for plume tracking. So using it in a uh, in a in a sense, you doing the the time lapse VSPs. And how is uh, fiber optics being used for geothermal? Uh, in uh, there have been some. Uh, there are a couple of projects that are going on. Is it? Project Forge in Utah. Uh, this, these are projects in the U.S. And then also a, a project that was recently announced by uh, the results of which were announced by Fervo Energy. And in these, both of these cases, um, uh, the main use has been to be able to do the fracturing of this tight or totally impermeable rock that they're trying to just get fractures in. Uh, the stimulation of that rock so that they can connect between two well bores. So that is uh, using the technology, not the same results, but the, the technologies that were developed in the fracture diagnostics part of uh, the oil and gas applications. In single mode, what is the diameter of the core? And for multi-mode, what is the diameter of the core? Uh, for multi-mode, it's, it's uh, I believe that is like around 60 or 65 uh, microns, micrometers. Uh, for the single mode, it's, uh, they're typically seven to 10 micrometers. If you use the same fiber measurement to estimate both temperature and strain, won't it be non-unique? The, uh, let's say, uh, the answer is no, it does not have to be non-unique. Uh, you can use the same fiber and you can interrogate it with using two different technologies. Uh, so you could do a, a, uh, a Brewan measurement, it could, you could also do a Raman type measurement on it and use that to help deconvolve the temperature from the strain. Uh, you can also, uh, there are ways to work with the data to be able to de that are deconvolved through some different uh, uh, some different processing of the signals. So you can it is possible. It's routinely done to um, uh, you're routinely able to to deconvolve. If you're using it for a uh, for like a Ray Rayleigh frequency shift, uh, then typically 
the same fiber can be used or usually an adjoining fiber would be used for uh, making a DTS measurement and then that temperature could be used to correct or to to, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to provide the uh, uh, basically the number of, of equations that you need for the number of unknowns. And what is the life of DAS in well monitoring? What is the life? I'm, I'm not sure I understand that. Can an installed um, DAS be used for the life of the well? Uh, so we're, we don't want to think about it as the life of the D, DAS. We want to think of it as the life of the fiber, op, fiber de, installation itself. As long as that fiber stays in and has not been broken or uh, degraded in any fashion, it can be interrogated with a DAS instrument or any other instrument for the lifetime of the well or actually the lifetime of that fiber. Very good. Well, thanks everyone for your questions today. Later today, you will receive a link to a recording of today's webinar, an evaluation form, and a link to register for in-well fiber optic sensing scheduled for November 6th through 7th in Houston, Texas. Thanks very much for joining us. Goodbye.